Let's see. So I'm not on my local machine here, but actually connected to a machine running in Brussels via VNC. And let's see. So that's the raw VM, and I tell it to use 16 of my uh, 16 hyperthreads. And I will run a demo uh, from Max Orhai. So I haven't implemented that, but uh, Max did that. And so what you see here is just a standard old school Squeak 3.7 uh, Squeak image with an MVC interface. And if I turn on sampling over here, you see which cores are actually executing bytecodes. So the blue stuff is bytecodes. And the red stuff is exec or showing on which core processes are actually scheduled. And as you see here, that's my physical cores or uh, threads. And they are all pretty busy. So that's done for performance reasons. We burn cycles if you get them. And uh, the first thing I want to show is just a simple demo of a flock of birds. Oh, wait. As you see, that's every of these black dots is basically one process, and it gets scheduled in parallel. And there is no global synchronization going on whatsoever. And um, there is some logic to find nearby birds and change the direction in which we are moving. And that's executed fully in parallel. So let me turn off the sampling and the demo. So one possible application is that's what what you just saw is something Dave and Sam implemented. And what you see now is a basic demo how you could do sorting in a non-deterministic way. Let me sort of birds seems like it would be possible in one code. Just a refresh thread, right? <coughs> um, the black points actually indicate how long uh, the interval is between the refreshes, but uh, the virtual machine itself is sufficiently slow that it wouldn't be faster on a single core. So uh, what I'm going to do here is I will add the number of data items. No. So basically, these dots represent some data. Um, the color is basically the well, the characteristic after which uh, those data points are sorted, and. If I run that for a number of steps, at the moment you don't see any patterns. But after a number of steps, you should see um, that according to the color, the, the dots are moving to a certain place. That's a <coughs> two-dimensional grid. And you might already see the upper left corner becomes pretty green, and the lower right kind of purplish. The bottom layer is blue. And the right uh, hand side should be red. So that's something which is not really deterministic. Every time one of these dots is colliding with another dot, it basically compares itself to the dot and decides in which direction to go. And after a sufficient amount of iterations, uh, we basically get to a point where the sorting has a sufficiently high quality. You still see, like, uh, like that blue dot here, it's constantly bumping into something, and it's not really going downwards. Or that red <coughs> dot, which is not really on the right hand side. So it's not, not completely accurate, but in general, the overall picture, I think, from the colors becomes obvious uh, that the general idea kind of works. So and that's basically um, the motivation behind <coughs> the raw VM. So we want a platform for experimenting with such kind of non-deterministic algorithms to find useful applications where they could actually be used in real life. OK. So 20 minutes, that's 15 more minutes. So I will spare you all the technical details, I think, uh, except you are very interested. One, OK. Two, well, um, there are too many slides in the talk, so. Uh, I will give you give you a brief overview of uh, what the problem is with current hardware, I think. 
and then we see how far we get. Um, if you imagine how a processor could look like today or in two or three years on your usual desktop CPU, you might imagine something like maybe 16 core Intel chip and you have four cores today. Um, they pretty much look the same like they looked uh, 20 years ago. You basically just put more of these chips on the same uh, kind of die. But uh, what happens in those kind of embedded systems where they have real many core systems already today, it's not like just we have memory and then we have a number of uh, processors, but they actually put these processors in a grid and then they have network connections between the cores and just, well, they have all kinds of different purpose networks and one of them is actually usable for applications. And if you want to implement a virtual machine for these kind of systems, you have to know that the performance to go to your main memory, which is basically the green uh, bar, is not really good. So actually, if you want to transfer 10 words from the main memory to another core, it takes like, I don't know, 1,000 clock cycles. And if you actually send a message with one of the other networks directly between cores, then it's taking significant less time. So that was one of the main observations uh, which kind of um, influenced the design of that virtual machine. So the, we basically want to be able to leverage the hardware capabilities. And uh, with the Tyler chip we are using, that's mainly uh, direct message passing between different cores. So and what's the result until now? We have a virtual machine which is mainly written from scratch. That means uh, David Unger took the squeak um, virtual machine, generated the C code, and looked at it and transformed it into or rewrote it in C++ for reasons of uh, tooling on the Tylera platform and also convenience with the few additional type um, informations you can have in C code, uh, C++ code over C code. So going with the slang implementation wasn't really um, the way to go for him. Um, and what we can run, you saw, that's basically an MVC image on a single core. You also can uh, run standard squeak and faro images, not with the newest uh, cock changes, I believe, but uh, squeak 4.1 and Faro 1.1 should uh, work out of the box. If you go with more cores, then we have still issues. But uh, <coughs> feel free to step in and help us fix it. OK. <coughs> when it comes to platforms, well, we don't support Windows. That's the main idea here. Uh, we don't do any fancy stuff, so we rely on a simple x11 interface. Uh, and we just haven't ported the necessary platforms for for instance, macOS. But on the other hand, on the Telera system, uh, we run up to 59 cores, which is pretty nice. And that's exactly what we are after for our experiments. Um, another point I want to mention is the infrastructure. Um, there is plenty of opportunity to collaborate with the other small talk um, communities, especially if it comes to performance regression testing. So we really have a lot of bugs in our virtual machine over the time. And if you don't track, uh, keep track of your performance, then you have these kind of performance behavior. And I only found that after setting up uh, the performance regression testing. So that was pretty good. And usually, if I work on an experiment and want to write a paper, then I run into these performance regressions. And only when I run my benchmarks, I notice, ah, damn. I don't know how many months back we introduced here another performance regression. And I don't know uh, who's interested in benchmarking, but uh, yeah. Oh, I am. OK. Uh, maybe we can use this print tomorrow to find some common ground. We are reading uh, from the EMAP side or directly in C for <coughs> the BS? Um, the benchmarks we are using are some of the uh, language shootout benchmarks and uh, at least one uh, custom implemented sorting algorithm from the NASA parallel benchmarks. Uh, but they are in small talk, so they are reusable. Uh, the framework I'm using to run the benchmarks is written in Python for convenience and for um, 
Well, because I already had some infrastructure there. But, uh, oh, yeah. Where are the then in the street stores or everything is in the, the benchmarks? Yes. Um, they are on GitHub. On GitHub. Because uh, one thing we are using is uh, we have a just recently that's not yet on GitHub, uh, but we have an exporter for our source to manage it uh, with Git. And um, that's done because we hadn't had anything like source control before. And uh, now we have at least Git. Uh, Monticelli import to the squeak image we are using is uh, oh, just too much. That doesn't work for us. Because we, we only have few memory on the Talara, and we need small images on the Talara. OK. But if you want to play with a virtual machine, you can just go to the GitHub URL, download the code. There should be a configure script uh, to make it run on Linux and OS X systems. Um, yeah, there was the discussion of Google Summer of Code. There are also a few interesting projects. Uh, if someone is interested in this kind of stuff, uh, just getting squeak running or looking into garbage collection for Perl machines, really cool algorithms, really cool projects there. And yeah, let me know. Okay, let's have a look at the implementation. So the general idea is that we have that like uh, eight times eight core virtual machine uh, hardware system, and then we run one interpreter instance basically on each of these cores, and on top of that as a whole single system image and standard terminology, or you have basically a shared memory environment like in your standard uh, Java system, which runs multi-core. When it comes to the language. Um, there are not too many changes. So actually, only what is absolutely necessary. Um, one thing, we are going from a cooperative and a bit preemptive green uh, threading scheme to a real parallel scheme. So that's, that's problematic for the usual standard libraries in Squeak. But at least for the image we are using, turns out it's not much of a headache. It just works. Um, when it comes to the library changes, one important change, if you know the process object, which is basically uh, every time created, you take a block and send it a fork message. Then there are some, um, and the process object and then the process scheduler, some adaptations. So usually in a squeak image or a Faro image, you have, of course, the notion that there is only one single active process. And that's not true anymore. So uh, we introduced this process to signify the current process you are executing on that particular core. And then you can find out whether any of the other project uh, processes is actually currently executed. And the process class itself, um, <coughs> there are also a few changes, mainly to request a yield conditionally if you just don't have enough physical cores to execute the process. Or you can schedule that process only on a limited number of cores and well, if it comes to the programming, usually people ask me, for example, how to program in Perl. But you already have everything in Smalltalk, so I usually don't get sufficient. Just take a block and send it a fork message. How hard can it be? OK, and when it comes to uh, synchronization, it's just a standard uh, semaphore class. Good. Um, seven more minutes. Let's talk about the about, uh, implementation details. So what we get is basically a shared memory system. But um, to enable that in a sufficient uh, performant way, um, we basically split up our heap into um, chunks for every core. That's only relevant for allocation and object movement, but not really for accessing objects. So you can just grab an object, pointer, go, and uh, read a field. That's not a problem. But if an object is allocated on a heap, um, then you allocate it on your local heap, which is associated to your core you're currently executing on. If for whatever reason you need to move an object to another core, so there is a primitive in the virtual machine which allows you actually to move these objects around, um, then you need a global save point. And then you can also allocate on that other remote core. But uh, that's mainly for experimenting and for testing out new strategies with 
regard to locality, cores, caches, these kind of things. So yeah. Um, that's basically a global synchronization. So one core comes and asks all other cores to reach a point. Yeah, to and stop it. Yeah, exactly. I have slides on how the implementation is done. Maybe we get there. You'll see. Another important point is how is it actually the scheduling done. Uh, we kept 99% of uh, what you currently have in terms of scheduling. So you still have your array of priorities, and then you have your linked list of processes. Uh, I think at the standard implementation, you remove a process if you're executing it. You keep it on the list, and then it's just executed by the, yeah, by the core, which grabs that. And then there's a lock associated to the whole scheduling structure you have to acquire before you can actually go and grab a new process to schedule. So that means if you are the interpreter instance. So basically, all the standard tools still work. You have a process browser. You can see which processes are executed and these kind of things. Um, yes. Yes. Sure. Of course, you don't have these scheduling guarantees anymore, and that's the main problem with standard Faro and Squeak images. Yes, so, exactly. And we don't have these guarantees anymore. But if you want to execute something in parallel, yeah, what, <laughs> what are you going to do? So basically, um, there are certain points where all the cores are notified that there is a scheduling event. And um, then they can basically grab the scheduling mutex and decide whether to reschedule a uh, process. And uh, if there's a higher priority uh, process available, then it's going to be executed. But if there are three cores running um, that can grab other lower priority processes, they also get executed. So yes, it's not a, yeah, you don't have the same guarantees you had before. Well, it's good for us. It's not so good for the squeak of our images. You mean it's easy to break the standard image, yes. Yeah. yeah. But we should change the current model. Model. The current model. The current model is bad. It's bad. We cannot break concurrent code with the assumption that the scheduler work in the same way because we are, we are bound to never get to see anything. Huh? Be my guest. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to work in Faro. I would really like to work on Faro, but uh, it's just so too much effort. Do, so what you should do in that case, just let's say you are about this idea of, the, of moving more stuff on the image level, and then you should submit things that say, OK, that's the real concurrent version of the semaphore. Then there is a change that can take it for me. I'm really bad in concurrent programming. So I'm sure that I can write any dead bug you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But this means that if you are concerned by that, propose things and slowly we said, okay, we want this real code. And piece by piece, we just throw away the rest. Sure. If you want a con atomic swap operation, no problem. Uh, we can implement it. Should be just a matter of minutes, actually. Um, okay. One important thing to know is to, to make that mostly safe, uh, we need actually to take care of primitives. Uh, as far as I know, the Java uh, approach to that is basically, OK, you're the programmer, you're an adult, you know what you're doing. Yeah, so you're exactly. Um, for the primitives we have in the virtual machine, we know kind of what they are doing. And uh, we categorize them. 
um, stuff which is safe and stuff which is not safe. And all the stuff which is not safe gets executed on the main core for several reasons. One of the reasons is if you look at the bitblip library currently implemented, you can do all kinds of fancy stuff, not just uh, displaying on the graphical display, but also just manipulating something in your local buffers. But the thing is, it's implemented with just standard C static variables and is not thread safe. And since we are running in a thread system with global shared memory, uh, with our virtual machine or Mac systems or Linux systems, that just doesn't work. So we have to force all those bit blip primitives, for instance, to run on the main core. And Okay, I could look. Any C code and you make it stress safe. Huh? You take any C code, any uh, squeak plugin and ah uh, slang. Yeah, okay. <laughs> we have the generated code. Yes, code, but uh, yeah, maybe I should look at it. Uh, but anyway, there are still primitives which you can't make thread safe. That's, for instance, taking a snapshot or uh, the idle process. We actually don't use the idle process for performance reasons. We can just burn the energy. We don't care. Green computing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's advanced research topic, I guess. Uh, anyway, so what we do is if you encounter a primitive you want or where you know it's not safe, like taking a snapshot, you have to stop the whole world to make that safe. Um, we basically wrap the current interpreter state, ship it over to the main core, uh, let the main core pause, get its state out, then load the interpreter state, execute the primitive, wrap up the results, and ship it back. So our foreign primitives are just executing on main core, and so you don't have to really take care how you program. But for instance, if you implement a thread which is updating the display, then you usually want to schedule it on the main core, otherwise you slow down the whole system. <coughs> okay, well, as I mentioned, one of the motivation was we want to use message passing between interpreters. And uh, that's done only in the virtual machine. It's not exposed to the small talk level. And there are a few things we do with that. It's like garbage collection, safe pointing, and yeah like sampling, as you saw, we can visualize which cores are executing how many bytecodes and these kind of things. Uh, so uh, there's a bit of stuff going on using the messages. Um, I could go into detail for the safe pointing, but I don't want to steal other people's time. So just a brief overview. Someone comes, wants a safe point, then the safe point manager of on the main core basically asks all the other um, interpreters to reach a point where it's safe to take a safe point. Once they are there, they send back an acknowledgement. And then you get the, if you requested the safe point, you get a notification that you now can do your uh, inherently unsafe stuff, like writing out an image and these kind of things. And uh, well, then How you get back. Pretty expensive. Very expensive. You don't want to do that. Um, at the moment, it's always necessary if you want to move an object. It's always necessary if you want to do a snapshot. And uh, if you want to do garbage collection in general. But that are the main points where you need uh, global synchronization. For all the other stuff, you don't usually need it. So they are rare in terms of, uh, they usually only occur for garbage collection. And our garbage collector is a uh, stops the world, marks sweep. Pretty simple, but correct, doesn't crash the virtual machine. <laughs> yeah, so you don't want to r force anyone to run into a, a safe point. That also means if you want to experiment with moving objects around, then you need to find a way around the safe points. At the moment, that's not possible, but that's something I have to look into in the future. Okay, so much for that. Um, well, that's, that's just one of our nice deadlocks we encountered with that kind of message passing, safe pointing, and then you run. Is the 
typically very, very easy in two deadlocks. And uh, yeah. One thing I want to mention still is the performance. I'm not comparing here to Squeak or anything. It's, uh, we are a bit slower, a bit, just a bit, like, I don't know. I don't want to mention the number. But, uh, what, yeah. Uh, what you see here is basically is that we have weak scalability. Weak scalability means you can add number of cores and you can increase uh, problem um, size in the same manner and you stay at the same runtime, almost. So we reached one of our goals. Uh, that's good for us. If you look on the many core system, it doesn't look that good anymore. You see here, after like 20 cores, it's going down pretty much. But that's advanced research. We haven't been looking into that a lot yet. Even integer Sorry? Integer loop? Even integer loop? Yeah. Now? That's. Um, it shouldn't do any allocation. There is no message sending going on. No context objects are allocated. Just addition on an integer. And even that goes down. So there are inherent limits in the new kind of many core architectures. And um, yeah, we need to look into how to, to make actual real problems run on that. So the most application like benchmark is usually the compiler benchmark that uh, that also gets just 10x.